I am Liz Mosley and welcome back to CBI at 10. Um, I've not done one of these for a few weeks, so I'm hoping I can remember what I'm supposed to do. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here and there's a lot to talk about today. Um, so I'm grateful to our panellists for joining us to try and make sense of um, the current status of the economy um, here in this country and what we've learned um, from various pieces of research and forecasting that have been done about what's going to happen next. Um, to kick us off, I'm going to go first to Alpesh Palaya, uh, Palaya. He We just had a conversation about how to pronounce the surname. I did it wrong. Alpesh Palaya, and who is lead economist at CBI, and you've just written um, the latest economic forecast for the CBI. But before we get into the detail of the forecast, Alpesh. Could you just give us a sense of the context? I mean, we've all had fun and games trying to get to work yesterday, but what else is going on out there? Sure, thanks very much, Liz. Um, so I think there are three key issues for businesses to be aware of this week. Um, so as you mentioned, firstly, we of course have the rail strikes, uh, which occurred yesterday uh, and are happening tomorrow and Saturday. Last minute talks to avert strike action failed, um, and that's particularly regrettable um, that strikes are going ahead at a time when the economy is under is under such strain and at a time when the railway industry is seeking to bounce back from two years of disruption and heavy reliance on government subsidy. Um, it looks like both passenger and freight services will be seriously impacted. Um, workplaces relying on the rail network will have to demonstrate even greater flexibility um, and delays to delivery of critical raw materials will inevitably add to existing supply chain challenges. Um, mm. It's worth thinking about the implications of this over, over the longer term. I mean, over the long term, a robust economical and efficient railway is an essential component of a decarbonised transport network. Um, and damaging industrial in action now could delay the much needed shift that needs to occur away from high polluting vehicles onto the railway, uh, thus undermining confidence and investment in the sector. So that's the first issue. Um, the second is the by-elections taking place uh, this week, tomorrow in fact, in Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton. Um, while not a strictly business critical issue, um, I'm sure that many will be watching this week's election results with interest. Um, following the confidence vote a couple of weeks ago and ongoing media speculation on the Conservative leadership, uh, the CBI has made several interventions calling on the government to stop Operation Save Big Dog and instead focus on economic action stations, particularly in, like, in light of a weak, weaker economic outlook ahead, which I'll come on to talk about. Um, we recently published a list of actions the government can take now uh, to boost confidence, uh, which we will share in the chat. Um, and thirdly, just a quick plug for the CBI's uh, Future of Work conference, which is taking place on the 13th of September. Uh, we know that the world of work has changed. Uh, the pandemic has shifted expectations of how, where and when we work. Uh, one million people have left the workforce during the pandemic uh, and the UK is facing really tough labour shortages with no quick fix in sight. Uh, so our conference sort of will provide insights into how businesses can navigate this new landscape. Um, it's now open for registration so you can find out more um, on our website. Um, so to summarise, Obviously, rail strikes and by-elections this week um, and our Future of Work conference in September will provide more insights on, on the other timely issue of, of labour shortages. Thanks so, so much, Alpex. It does feel like there's a really packed agenda if you were sitting there in number 10 thinking, how do I tackle these things in what order? And your economic forecast that was published, was it published just yesterday? It's hot off the press, I think, um, is no different. Um, now, Ray Newton-Smith, who's the chief economist of the CBI, and sometimes joins us for these conversations um, on CBI at 10. Her quote says, this is a tough set of statistics to stomach. Easy for me to say. Um, I just wonder if you could give us the headlines. Really, it's about a revised down in your growth forecast, isn't it? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we have revised down our outlook for growth and we do expect a much weaker uh, economic outlook further ahead. Um, so sort of before we go into the forecast, it's worth very briefly just taking stock of where we are on the economy right now. Um, data does seem to be pointing to a sharp slowdown in activity over the coming months. We've seen big falls in consumer and business confidence and for consumer confidence in particular, we've seen the largest fall on record. Uh, business surveys, including the CBI's own surveys, are pointing to softer growth in activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, consumer facing sectors are suffering, particularly sort of consumer services like hotels, bars and restaurants. Um, 
and while the labour market is very tight, we might you know, we are starting to see signs, very early signs of a softening. You know, we did see a notable pickup in the unemployment rate over March. Um, all of that does broadly chime with our economic forecast in which we do expect weaker growth over the year ahead. The main driver of that is high inflation. Uh, we've just had data out just this morning showing that CPI inflation uh, rose above 9% in May, staying at, at the 40-year high that we saw in April. Um, obviously, inflation has been rising uh, for global reasons. It's, it's very much a global problem. Uh, pressures in global supply chains combined with rising demand uh, as economies lifted COVID restrictions have pushed up commodity prices. That's been exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. Um, but also, you know, there are signs that higher inflation is becoming more widespread within the CBI basket, sort of moving to more domestically focused uh, bits of the basket itself. The upshot is we we ex we expect inflation to remain high this year. It doesn't fall much below eight percent, and in particular, peaks again in October uh, when Ofgem is widely expected to raise the energy price cap again. Um, that strength in inflation bites quite hard for households and it means that we expect to see the biggest fall in households real incomes this year since records began in the mid-1950s um, and we do expect household spending alone to enter a technical recession it, it falls persistently for the next year um, and while everyone will see a squeeze in their living standards it's worth noting that it's the poorest households who will be hit the hardest because they spend more of their income on staples like food and utility bills but have already seen sort of a hit to their finances uh, from the pandemic um, falling household spending is the main driver of the weakness in economic growth over our forecast and in particular sort of when we go into next year growth pretty much just slows to a crawl um, we don't expect the economy as a whole to fall into a technical recession um, but this will very much feel like a recession to many households and as I said earlier businesses will be facing a weaker trading environment one of the key things preventing the economy from falling into the red is business investment. Um, we actually do expect some growth in investment until early next year, and a crucial support to that is coming from the government's uh, super deduction. Um, but this story actually changes in, in the spring of next year once the super deduction is, it expires. It's scheduled to expire in April 2023. Um, and after that, business investment falls back and actually ends our forecast still 7% below its level prior to the pandemic. Um, and alongside that, a, a key theme in our forecast, alongside sort of this weakness in household spending and, and the reversal in business investment, is just how weak the other underpins to growth are. You know, we, we, we don't really see a recovery in exports. You know, they, they pick up a bit, but they're still 10% their pre 10% below their pre-COVID level at the end of next year. And that stands in quite stark contrast to other advanced economies where exports either recover or have already exceeded this benchmark. Again, productivity remains quite sluggish. It only gets back to its underwhelming pre-COVID trend. And that, that now marks over a decade where productivity in the UK has been effectively stagnant. And that's a huge drag uh, on, the, on the UK's living standards and, and our economy's capacity to grow over the longer term. So all of that really underscores the need for concerted action to address this sort of structural weakness in the UK economy. Um, you know, the government really needs to make a full commitment to a permanent successor to the super deduction, uh, particularly given uh, the key role that business investment is playing in the near term uh, in supporting the economy. Um, you know, given the tightness in the labour market, you know, re it's time to really get real on concerns over labour shortages. You know, things like sort of uh, drafting a new shortage occupation list, adding on sectors with obvious labour shortages like aviation um, and introducing flexibility to the apprenticeship levy so that employers can kind of use the levy uh, funds to tackle labour shortages. You know, th these are these are among just a few actions that need to take place um, to sort of restore confidence in the outlook and really shore up both near and longer term growth. Um, so that's a very whirlwind summary. As I say, it's not looking good further ahead. Uh, the cost of living crisis is very much set to persist, at least um, over the coming year. Um, there are a few things that keep us out of recession, and business investment is notably one of them, but that's very much a temporary support. And with other growth underpins looking weak, government really needs to do more to boost productivity and confidence. Alpesh, it's fascinating um, hearing the sort of package of challenges and of pressures. I've just noticed um, Emma Swan has asked a question um, to, to um, where can we find the economic forecast. I'm sure that 
um, Alice will post one in the chat. Uh, I know it is published on the CBI website if you want to sort of dive into the detail of some of these things. I'd love to come back to you as well, Alpesh, to talk about some of the other sort of package of recommendations. Just before I do, just in case people watching or listening don't know what the super deduction is, because I know the CBI has been calling for a, an extension or a successor, successor to that um, policy for a while. Just briefly give us a sense of what that what that facility does and what would replace it if and when it comes to an end when it's scheduled to? Sure. So the super deduction um, is essentially a tax incentive for companies to invest. It allows them to claim back um, sort of 150% of, of the tax that they otherwise would have paid on the investment itself. And that was very specifically designed to not only incentivize new investment, but for companies to sort of bring forward investment that they had sort of planned um, further ahead. Um, Obviously, you know, that's that has been, you know, we have survey data that suggests that that, that has been a big underpin uh, in supporting capital spending um, at a time when, you know, the recovery from COVID was looking a bit shaky. Uh, that's not only important for the near term, but it's also important for the longer term because growing the capital stock, uh, you know, boosts the economy's potential to grow over the longer term. Um, and we've called uh, for uh for, for a permanent successor to the super deduction. So not necessarily one that's as generous as it is at the moment, but one that kind of allows companies to claim back 100% uh, of the tax on capital spending, um, but also um, widening the definition. So it includes uh, more assets. Um, and so, so there are more sort of eligible assets for um, for investment in 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 that regard, and and you know that there is a there is a good structural case for that. You know the UK doesn't do very well on investment allowances compared to other countries, so this would only be helping us to sort of narrow the gap with other G7 economies uh, where business investment is a lot stronger. Thanks ever so much. That's really helpful. While we're talking about investment, this is a good moment to bring in Peter Arnold, who's joined us this morning, chief economist of EY. Um, the CBI's uh, recommendations. Business investment is this critical lever to sort of try and balance out some of the headwinds that are hitting us that, over which we have little control because many of them are global factors. And EY, you've just published your annual survey, haven't you, about um, specifically uh, the UK attractiveness survey. Just talk us through how uh, investors are feeling about the UK as a place to invest and do business right now. So, um... Liz, as you mentioned, we do an annual survey of FDI, so foreign direct investment into UK, and indeed it's a European-wide survey. So we look at the the, the volume of, of FDI investments, but also the drivers of, of that investment. I mean, actually, the UK does does pretty well when you look at its performance across Europe. So, um, unsurprisingly, inward investment fell quite dramatically in 2020 by about 13% across Europe, 12% in the UK, and and it's bounced back a little bit in 2021. So investment up by about 5%. UK did a little bit, lagged Europe a little bit, so only by about 2%. But when you look at measures of sentiment and when we ask investors where they see the most attractive locations for inward investment, UK was second to France this year and, and London comes out as, as the number one city across Europe as, as a place to for, for foreign investors to, to base their businesses. So um, the domestic landscape and the international landscape, I think, are always slightly different, but actually um, foreign investors still see the UK as a, as a really important place to, to put their investment across Europe. And what have you found in terms of the key insights from the survey? Has anything changed? Are there new sort of considerations that need to be sort of, a, you know, accounted for in, for example, government policy? What shifted? You know, you would think with the things that have happened in the world, and with Brexit as well in the last couple of years, we've been treating a really, really different picture in terms of attractiveness, but is everything looking pretty much the same? I think there's probably a sort of short term and a kind of medium to long term um, issue that we've seen. So I think if you compare the top three in Europe, so France, Germany and the UK, France had a much better year in 2021. It really rebounded, projects grew by about 20% and France very much the, the leader across Europe in terms of attracting inward investment. UK in second. Actually, Germany had a really tough year last year. Investment was actually down in Germany by about 10%. And I think a bit of that reflects the kind of the relative strengths of those economies and their experience through COVID. So the French economy um, has actually proved a little bit more robust and rebounded a little bit more quickly 
off the back of COVID than either the UK or, or the German economies. And perhaps it's a little bit more balanced. So UK very service orientated, very impacted by global travel bans, or Germany very um, manufacturing orientated. And so really caught up in the global disruption we've seen to automotive supply chains. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, you know, those types of pressures we'd expect to ease as the supply chain blockages and international travel come back. But I think longer term, what we did see across Europe was manufacturing investment had recovered far more quickly than investment in services. And we thought that was quite interesting because we may be beginning to see a bit of a trend. It's where that, that whole story about rebuilding supply chains, more resilient supply chains, more localized supply chains might be playing out in a, in a sort of a, a surge of reinvestment in European manufacturing capability. And actually the UK lags a little bit there and, and Brexit is a, an element of why perhaps the UK is not as attractive as it would be. And then when it comes to services investment, this shift to hybrid working, the, the use of online technology may mean that if you're a service business, digital business, you don't need the physical presence that perhaps you needed in the past. So that was an interesting trend that, that we'll keep a close eye on um, over the next couple of years. Do you think that um, there seems to be sort of a balance in the forecast that Alpesh has been talking about, which is how the the next year to 18 months or so is going to feel for people, um, households in this country, and some of the numbers that might sort of float in in the, the sort of more macroeconomic picture in the business picture, which is going to be a challenge for the government to sort of tell a story about if it's, if it's a recession in all but name, because it feels that way on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think that kind of weaker economic outlook will damage the UK's attraction? this to investors or do you think what we'd be able to sell through so i mean you made an important point and as did alpash that this is very much a kind of global story so the the forces are buffeting the uk economy in supply chains and energy prices and indeed around tight labor markets that's a global story it's not just a uk story those apply elsewhere um so I think, you know, we should see the UK's performance in that global context. I think there are elements of the current environment that make the UK in certain sectors less attractive. So, you know, automotive manufacturing so tied into European supply chains and, and manufacturing more generally. I think that will be a challenge. Um, but areas where the UK has got an outright competitive advantage, whether that's financial services, where it's digital, whether it's some elements of high value manufacturing, then it will continue to be an attractive place to to invest. I think the key thing is the model where you set up shop in the UK to serve a European market, the kind of, if you like, the classic Japanese investment model, that is clearly less challenge or less attractive in a, in a post-Brexit world, but the UK remains a leader in, in digital, the European leader in digital. And so, you know, if you're a big US tech company, the UK is going to be your first port of call. Yeah, fascinating. Thanks ever so much, Peter. If you have questions for Peter, please do let us know. I'm going to come now to um, to Chan in the glorious Midlands. Um, lovely to see you. Good morning, Chan. Thank you for being here. Um, Chan Kateri, you're the Chief Executive for EMH Group. And just in case people don't know about your business, um, what do you do? How do you operate? How long have you been around? Just give us a sense of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so EMH is Midlands Housing. It's been around since 1946, um, we provide affordable housing for people for, for whom the marketplace cannot provide the housing solution solutions. Um, so we've got a 21,000 homes across the East Midlands um, and a revenue turnover of uh, 130 million. We most of our housing is provided for rent, although we also uh, provide develop and manage and maintain shared ownership housing. For many people, that's about the only way they can get onto the ladder where they buy a certain share of home. Mm -hmm. And as their circumstances improve, they can staircase upwards. And we also have a, a adult oh. social care business um, mm -hmm. where we provide um, services for people with learning difficulties um, and also adult um, um, uh, social care services for people in extra care schemes. So mm -hmm. These are schemes where people can live independently, but also uh, ask for care support, care and support, as their circumstances require it. So Chan, you are working with a lot of people who fit the definition of, um, you know, the, the the people least able to cope, the the households with who are going to feel the cost of living squeeze most keenly. Just give us a sense of 
what you're seeing already from the clients and beneficiaries that you work with in terms of the affordability of life at the moment? How, how is that playing back into your business already? Well, as you say, Liz, we uh, work with some of the most disadvantaged people in society whose average or median incomes will be lower than the national median incomes. Um, and they don't have the wherewithal to cope with shocks in terms of inflation and rising costs. So we are seeing a lot of people relying on food banks. Um, a lot of our people who live in our tenancies are not necessarily in full-time employment. And if they are, usually, uh, or in many cases, these are uh, you know, insecure forms of employment, uh, zero hours contracts. There's a great deal of uncertainty already, many of these people. Um, now with food and fuel prices going up and energy prices going up, they are beginning to feel the pinch. We know this because a lot more um, of our residents are relying on food banks, in fact, to the point where the food banks are having to restrict the amount that they can um, give to those people in, in need. So they're going through a particularly difficult time. We're trying our very best to support them. Uh, we have increased our financial inclusion, inclusion resources. So these are people who are working with our communities to see how we can maximize their debt, uh, maximize, uh, sort of manage their debt, maximize their incomes and any benefits that they may be entitled to. And, you know, we're not in the business, we're in the business of housing people. We're not in the business of evicting people. So we work really hard with them to ensure they don't get into rent arrears, but it is becoming extremely difficult. I know a lot of them are basically, you know, choosing whether to eat or eat. They're choosing um, whether to pay, you know, their utility bill or indeed their rent. And these are difficult choices to make in the way that they've never had to make for a long, long time. So uh, we are seeing a lot of people uh, in a difficult situation. Our rent arrears are gradually creeping up. And, you know, uh, this, um, along with the fact that we're actually struggling to recruit labor, because we do have 1,200 employees um, in the organization, and we're really struggling to recruit. We've got a higher turnover than we've ever had. Um, and if we can't get the frontline maintenance workers or frontline care workers, we can't provide those services. And that makes it even worse for those people who are already going through a difficult time. But I think just to add to that, that um, traditionally, um, you know, local authorities would have been in a position to provide greater support, particularly for those, uh, you know, with mental health issues. Uh, of course, um, over the last decade and, and longer, they've had to endure cuts. So they're in uh, much less of a position to provide the kind of support they would have done. So we do end up picking up some of those cases as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a particularly uh, easy time at the moment for our residents. Chan, if we take a couple of those pressures, on the one hand, the people who um, for whom you are their landlord, effectively, they, 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 they pay your rent. That is a massive chunk of your revenue and they're struggling to meet those bills and then on the other hand after that your ability as a business to find the people you need to deliver the services you do provide let's take those two in turn on the first point do you think that the package of measures that the government has already announced is sufficient to help you with the people being able to afford to pay the, the, the rent and or are there other things that you as a business would like to see happening to sort of alleviate that pressure? Yeah, I mean, some of the measures clearly will be of help, particularly in terms of, um, you know, grants to help with their energy costs and so on and so forth. Um, but clearly it's not enough. You know, I think, um, you know, the, the resilience of our residents to cope with some of the shocks uh, will be alleviated by those uh, measures. But I think one of the things government could do is to restore the £20 a week universal credit uplift that um, they introduced during the pandemic and then they removed. You know, that makes a lot of difference to our residents. Benefits generally haven't gone up by more than, well, they went up by 3.1% uh, this April in line with the September inflation last year so that clearly uh, represents a fall in real incomes um so i i think wherever possible 
um, the government should look to maintain I think, um, uh, um, universal credit support beyond the level they have at the moment, but also look at increasing benefits uh, to keep, at least keep, in, uh, keep pace with inflation. Mm. And on the labour shortages point, we've talked about this a lot at the CBI, and I'm going to come back to Alpesh in a second um, because some recommendations about how to alleviate some of these labour shortages are in the forecast. Um, what would you like to see happening as a business to help you fill those critical gaps? As you say, it's frontline maintenance, which really matters when you're, you know, you've got a leaking pipe or something that needs fixing and you're struggling to get the people who have the skills and the availability and want to do that work. How can you, in a sort of sharp end challenge like that, you know, the pipe is leaking, I need someone now. What could be done differently to help take the pressure off? I mean, they're clearly... Uh some long-term solutions to this we need to start thinking about. Um, for instance, in terms of the care this part of our business, the government promised the Green Paper, which is going to look at um, workforce planning for the care sector. Um, I think the other thing they can do, and that's something that's been long overdue, and they need to really bring that forward. Um, the other, because in terms of our care business, we've got turnover of 25%. Uh, we're just not able to fill those posts. Um, and that means people in serious need of care and support are not receiving that service that they desperately need. So there is a, a real urgent issue here. And I think the, um, the promised green paper on care and support, uh, which was going to look at both the funding, the long term vision for the care sector and indeed workforce planning needs to be really brought forward. Um, beyond that, of course, you know, um, we, we need to uh, ensure that um, where possible, the ability for where we cannot get labour in this country, the ability for people from abroad to come along to um, meet our uh, needs is made a lot more easier than it is at the moment. So um, I think that's got to be part of the, part of the answer. But also the, the pay levels uh, in the care sector are particularly low at the moment. Um, and that's mainly due to the fact that the commissioning bodies who pay us to provide those services, mainly adult social care departments and local authorities, um, simply haven't got the money to keep pace with the costs of providing those services. And the biggest cost, of course, is the cost of labour. So we're not able to attract people into the sector because the pay levels are relatively lower than others. It's fascinating um, listening to Chan talk about the specific, very precise things that would help his business and the, the clients that use it right now. Alpesh, in your forecast, there is a package of measures that you recommend or call for um, that would, some of which would, would have a, a much more near term impact to alleviate some of the things that Chan is is talking about just talk us through you know when we've talked about labor shortages and skills planning and things very often we end up looking at sort of not even a decade away you know it's a, lo a long time but there are some things that could or should arguably be happening now aren't there yeah certainly i mean i <clears throat> i'm sure you know a lot of what what chan has just said will be resonating with businesses you know up and down the country you know when when we talk when we talk to businesses the tightness in the labor market and just the the, the implications that that's having for sort of recruitment and retention um and you know sort of filling those those very sort of mission critical roles is 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 quite profound um so i think look i mean it's quite telling that we haven't actually you know, put together a new shortage occupations list for about three years, um, mm. ever since sort of reforms to um, the UK's immigration regime were were sort of put into force. Um, so it's time to really take a granular look at that um, and and think about, you know, where, where are the roles that we need to plug the gaps most? Because obviously the labour market has evolved, uh, has evolved rather a fair bit over the last um, over the last few years. Um, and adding sectors that are facing very obvious skill shortages. You know, aviation is a very good example where you had um, a lot of workers actually leave the um, leave the sector during the pandemic just because obviously they were more likely to be put on furlough. It was a sector that was most affected by sort of travel restrictions. Um, and so as a result, now that the, now that the sector is sort of coming back to life, um, they're really struggling to find the people um, that they need. And, and, you know, that that plays into a lot of the stories that we're hearing at the moment about sort of flights being cancelled um, and sort of issues at airports. Um, 
hospitality is another very good example, which is sort of facing similar issues. A lot of people, a lot of workers sort of left the industry during the pandemic. They've got jobs elsewhere. They've retrained. So now really the sector is facing um, is facing an acute shortage of skills. So, so sort of you know revisiting the shortage occupations list and thinking about how it is fit for purpose for the for for, for where we are at the moment in the economy um is actually quite uh important um and then sort of reforms to the apprenticeship levy um, are also quite a key one. You know, that there needs to be a lot more flexibility in that, you know, just to allow the employers uh, in the country to sort of use their funds as they need to skills wise, you know, to, to, to tackle the labour shortages that they're facing um, in their in their immediate business. Um, that's obviously um, sort of just two measures, but 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 two measures that could really have uh, could really make a big difference in the near term, particularly as I say that we, we seem to be in that that state of persistent tightness in the labour market. And while we expect some of that to ease going forward, we do expect a bit of a loosening in the labour market um, as 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 the economic as the economy weakens. Mm. Actually, it still remains relatively tight. You know, by the end of our forecast, the the unemployment rate is only just a little bit above four um, percent, which is still very close to historic lows. So this this doesn't seem to be a problem that's going away anytime soon. So it's clear that more immediate action is needed. Alpesh, just briefly before I come to Peter, there's been a great question asked about investment. Um, if if um, the shortage occupations list was to be reviewed, as you suggest, and let's say a new type of role or sector was added to that list, what does that practically do? What does being on that list unlock in terms of labour shortages? What happens? Well, well, I suppose in summary, at a very high level, what it does is that it sort of makes the immigration rules around that particular occupation just a bit looser. Um, so if you do have um, uh, a, a, an occupation on that list, what it means is that sort of priority will be given uh, to economic migrants who have qualifications which kind of meet that role or sort of who are moving here um, um, to sort of for that sort of job. Um, it makes sort of recruiting from abroad um, a bit easier for businesses as well. So it just means that we're able to get the people that we need for the roles that we need more seamlessly, which is really what you want at the moment, which is really what you need in a labour market that's so tight. Yeah, fascinating. Thanks ever so much. And um, Peter, I want to put to you a question um, that's been asked by um, Jack Semple, who is, is watching today. Given the government's new policy imperative to reverse the historic decline in UK manufacturing, um, and what you were talking about earlier uh, about manufacturing re re investment having reduced due to Brexit, what, what, what can or should the government do? Are they doing enough? Um, should they be doing something differently to ensure that manufacturing recovers to where we want it to be? Yeah, I mean, it's a it, very good question. And I think um, we probably almost need to think around a kind of a industrial strategy, dare I say it, that, that really thinks, OK, well, there are some real challenges around lack of access to the single market, but we still have some areas of competitive strength. And the question is really around scaling up those areas and focusing on those areas, perhaps rather than trying to, you know, um, capture parts of, of, of the manufacturing um, landscape that, that have gone. I think one area where we, why do see or our survey suggests there may be an opportunity is around the whole kind of green agenda or clean tech agenda so um, we call it clean tech in our survey but you can call it the green industrial revolution there is clearly lots of investment is going to be going into renewable technology is going to be going into electric vehicles is going to be going into um, heat pumps and so on and I think there's a real opportunity here given some of perhaps the natural advantages the UK has in terms of its um, you know the renewable opportunity around offshore wind and hydrogen and, and CCUS and so on that that you really try and focus on ensuring that UK is not just deploying all these technologies that perhaps arguably we have done so far with offshore wind and if you look at the new nuclear program a lot of that is reliant on technology from France or, or from China but we really look to, to, to develop and build those technologies as well as just deploying them and I think that would be an area where I think the government really needs to think about focus support to try and establish critical mass so you get first mover advantage in those areas you build a, a globally competitive sector and that should hopefully kickstart or, or rebuild some of that manufacturing capability particularly in the, in the northwest east and, and, and in the west mids so I think that would be one opportunity I, I, I do see um, it's interesting, um, Peter, that uh, uh, you mentioned offshore wind farms because Alpesh, 
offshore wind farms is specifically called out right at the very top of your recommendations of what could be done this summer. Why is that? Why is that such a huge um, opportunity? Is it is it just totemic, or is it is it you know the, the quantum of it sufficient to make a difference? Yeah, I, I think I think it's both actually. I think you know there is you're sort of killing two birds with one stone. So I think what we've what we've called for is cutting approval times for new offshore wind farms um, from four years to one year. You know the fact that it takes four years mm -hmm. just to approve uh, the building of a new wind farm is, you know, is is a huge sort of lag when we think about the investment issue that we're facing. If if you sort of re reduce the approval time, um, that's in and of itself is an automatic boost. Uh, to business investment and as I say you know the UK does have a big structural investment problem compared to other G7 countries but obviously is also a key um, uh, you know is a key step forward in our journey towards net zero uh, and decarbonisation so it's sort of taking what is what is a long-standing economic challenge but also sort of tailoring, tailoring it a bit more uh, to sort of these new challenges that we're facing further ahead when we think about the need uh, to cut carbon emissions uh, to you know to secure our energy supply and you know that 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 also comes back to what we're seeing on the global front. We're very exposed to the volatility in global energy supply and global energy surprise, uh, global energy prices. Um, mm -hmm. And actually getting to a place where we we have a more secure domestic energy supply will will help to mitigate some of that. So you're sort of uh, you're you're sort of hitting um, lots of targets at once uh, with, mm -hmm. with just with just that that sort of one measure, if you like, which is why it's which is why it features so highly in our sort of package of 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 measures that are needed to boost confidence in the economy. I mentioned this slightly trepidatiously, Alpesh, but um, the introduction to the forecast is a sort of a, a flag, a warning, if you like, that there's a danger that the economy might play second fiddle, fiddle to politics. Um, you know, we're, we're in the sort of, uh, we're not quite the wind down the per period to recess, but there's not much time between now and the recess over the summer. Um, it, just in our last few minutes, um, you're calling for the government to resolve the Northern Ireland Protocol. I mean, if if only it was that easy. Are, are, what are the things that that uh, threaten, I suppose, to detract from the sort of hard, practical actions that could be taken that would really make a difference to not just people like Chan. Um, and the and the people who use who use the services that that, that um, the MH Group provides, but to everybody across the economy. What what are the things that threaten to derail the conversation? Well, I think you've pretty much just said it. it. It it's the threat that we see what we've seen over the last few weeks, which is politics taking centre stage. Um, at the expense of the economics. Um, so, you know, we saw, <coughs> you know, I said, excuse me, I said at the start of, of this webinar that, you know, we have called very explicitly for, for you, you know, focus to shift away around sort of Operation Save Big Dog and actually start thinking about the big economic challenges that we're facing, both in the near term with the cost of living crisis, but over the longer term, you know, a lot of the longer term structural issues uh, that the UK um, is facing haven't, haven't gone away. Um, and there is a risk that actually, uh, actually, what we've seen in the last few weeks does persist. So, you know, certainly um, coming back to sort of the Northern Ireland uh, protocol impasse, you know, unilateral action on the part of the UK is not helpful, um, and neither is the relative inflexibility on the EU side. And you know, this is coming at a time when businesses are already having to deal with a lot in terms of cost pressures, in terms of labour shortages, and now sort of facing a weaker demand environment as well. You know, we already have. Um, a structural exports underperformance you know our forecast that's a very key message coming across from our forecast and this the last thing we need is sort of more frictions um in trade with our biggest trading partner the eu um so really we we need both sides to really you know have the economy um at the forefront of their minds and at the forefront of their of their their sort of objectives the economy growth um thinking you know smoothing over the challenges we've got in the near term and that's why it's really important for both sides uh, to get on with the job of finding a negotiated outcome and and come back to the table uh, in the spirit of sort of compromise um and 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 uh, sort of a, a constructive mindset um, and you know you're right there's not a lot of time uh, before recess uh, there's only a very small window um, so it you know now's the time for action really you know, that's not yeah. something we can stress enough 
just um, briefly in our last couple of minutes, Chan, I'd love to come back to you um, and ask two asks. I can't guarantee that uh, Rishi Sunak is watching or listening, but <laughs> what would be the things that would make the biggest difference to your ability as a business to, to, to mitigate some of the challenges that are, that are happening right now? Um, yeah, an interesting question, Liz. I mean, the first thing to say is that uh, our rents are highly regulated rents, and the current rent settlement comes to an end in 2025. The government will start to consult on the future rent settlement. Um, and goes without saying that the current indexed policy that we have, where our rents go up by CPI plus 1%, is highly essential, not just to maintain our existing services, but to develop new homes. And we develop 550 new homes with a lower income uh, cap. Uh, we're likely to produce much less, a uh, lower number than that. But the biggest challenge we've got, and others have made reference to it, is that we've got to retrofit and decarbonize our existing homes. Um, so, you know, this does require a fair bit of investment. The first target we have is to bring all of our homes up to EPC level C by 2030. And then by 2050, we need to, you know, introduce clean heat, move away from fossil fuels and gas boilers. And we've already started that process with you know, air source heat pumps and external wall insulations and so on. All of this is really good uh, in terms of addressing fuel poverty, but it's also good from an environment point of view. So really, um, I would suggest that um, certainty on future rent policy and actually looking at the social housing decarbonisation fund, which really helps us to, um, you know, um, build this programme to the level we need to and do it a lot quicker. Yeah, fascinating. Well, thank you very much um, to all of our esteemed uh, panellists for joining us today. It's been, a, it's been a fascinating and I think important conversation. Um, you can see the detail in Al Pesh's forecast on the CBI website. I'm sure that if you were to go to the EY website, you'd be able to find the findings of the UK Attractiveness Survey too um, from Peter and the team at EY. Um, as I always say, before you go dive back into your emails, please do go and put the kettle on and look at the sunshine. And um, thank you very much to Chan and to Peter and to Alpesh for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. All the best. Bye bye. <laughs>